Good evening, everybody. Welcome to ProMed's webinar on safety critical communication protocols. My name is Matt. I'm the managing director of ProMed. I've been working in event control rooms and similar environments for the last 10 years or so, uh, working on radio communications, telephone communications, face to face communications, and a few other different methods. So thank you all for attending. I'm pleased to see a few of you regular faces and also welcoming new faces joining their first webinar with us. So just before we get started, uh, these webinars are provided free of charge, but we do also operate a business. So it's only right to use this opportunity to promote ourselves a little bit. First of all, uh, we are looking for some more staff members to join our ever growing team. Um, some of you may know that it is Living Wage Week if you follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, we are a living wage employer, so that means we pay a minimum of 11.75 an hour outside of London uh, or 13.50 an hour inside of London. So everybody who works on behalf of ProMed is a self-employed third-party subcontractor. So we've worked out the living wage, added in some holiday pay, pension contribution, national insurance contributions, everything that an employer would be expected to provide for their employee after a salary. Um, we've made sure that we provided that on top so that you can um, still be left with the living wage after you've made all of your contributions. We're also a signatory the prompt payment code, which means we're paying all of our suppliers within 30 days. Quite often we pay our staff a lot quicker than that where it's possible to do so. So if our clients pay us quickly, we make sure we pass that on to you. Um, and that just keeps everybody nice and happy. So we are looking for first responders. So if you've done your FREC 3 or you've got a high qualification or any equivalents, um, and for emergency medical technicians, as defined by the Purple Guide being FREC 4, higher or equivalent, then we are looking for staff of those grades to join us. We do have film and TV work coming in in various locations across the country at the moment. Uh, we are also speaking to event clients. So obviously everyone's a bit unsure about what's going to happen next year. But we are speaking to our event clients and we are wanting to reassure them that you know we do have a large staff pool so that if anybody does end up self-isolating we are still going to be able to deliver the standard of service that they want on the event so if you are interested please just email apply at promed999.co.uk our recruitment team will send you an application form and then once we receive that we will go through the vetting and screening process checking out your qualifications making sure you've got a dbs checking your id and your right to work and then we'll get you set up. All of our work is advertised on electronic platforms. It gets pushed out to you on WhatsApp, by text and in the Facebook group. Um, if you're qualified and are able to get to the job and you're the first person to apply, then it's as simple as that. We do have plenty of kit available. So we've got oxygen and NOx, automatic external defibs, and then general kind of first aid kit bags available. So if you need to borrow anything, that's not a problem. We can, we can arrange for that to happen as well. If you're not quite uh, at the FREC 3 level or you're at FREC 3 and you want to push on the FREC 4, then we do offer training courses. If you visit our website, promed999.co.uk forward slash training, we will give you the full details and the dates of our upcoming training courses. So our FREC 3 course also includes the level 3 award in administering medical gases. Uh, we're offering that at the moment for £390. Our next course with spaces on will be running on the 18th of January. That's going to be running on a Monday to Friday. Uh, if you can't uh, do Monday to Fridays, we do run a weekend only course, which is over three consecutive weekends. And that one commences on the 13th of February. The FREC 3 courses with us, you'll get a copy of Ambulance Care Essentials to keep. Um, we'll make sure you get lots of practice. There's lots of outdoor scenarios. Uh, there's realistic dispatch going on. Um, lots of makeup, fake blood, fake vomit, uh, really good courses. Our, our previous candidates have really enjoyed those. If you're at your FREC 3, you want to do your FREC 4, uh, we're offering that for £475. Um, our next course with spaces commences on the 23rd of January, running over three weekends. Those weekends are spaced out, uh, which is exactly as QualSafe intended it to be so that you've got time to go away and work on the workbook and then come back, do another module and then go away, work on your workbook, go away um, after the final module and you've only then got one workbook left to do. 
Uh, we give you a copy of Ambulance Care Practice and a stethoscope when you do your prep for with us. Ambulance Care Practice is a really good reference book to refer to. Uh, we refer to it quite often in our clinical practice uh, as part of our CPD when we're reflecting on, on our patient treatments. Um, if you have your FREC4 or you're a healthcare professional, you're looking at maintaining your qualification. Our next immediate life support course will be running on the 10th of January. That's just a one day course and we make sure you get the latest guidelines from Resource Council UK as a paper copy to keep. And if you work for a CQC company, you've got your FREC4 and you want to do a little bit more and get your safe administration of life saving medication course. That's available for £200 next running on the 5th and 6th of December. And we'll even throw in a Christmas present of a JR Calc pocket book for you. If you're interested in booking any of them, just drop us an email, training at promed999.co.uk, and we'll get you set up on our next course. So we're going to get stuck into tonight's training course. So thank you very much for attending. Uh, we believe that everybody here is in a space that's going to be free from bullying, intimidation, and harassment. We believe that all 15 of us here tonight have the right to be treated with dignity, respect and courtesy and not be discriminated against. Our full code of conduct, which applies to our physical and our virtual training, is available on our website. The link is available in the chat, thanks to admin team. And if you do need to report any inappropriate behaviour, privately message the admin team. Or if it's after the webinar, just drop an email to our webinars at promed999.co.uk email address. If there is anything you want to discuss or debate, that's absolutely fine. Throw it in the chat. Um, let's uh, discuss with one another. Let's learn from one another. That's absolutely fantastic. Just make sure you do so in a nice, respectful, kind and courteous way, please. So tonight's webinar, we're going to be looking at when safety critical communication protocols are needed, the role of the lead person, other parties involved in the communication, some general points, how and why we need to check for understanding, how and why we confirm the actions that are going to take place. And then we're going to end by looking at the slight difference for priority communication. So when are safety critical communication protocols needed? So can anybody think of any examples where they have needed to use a safety critical communication protocol or in their line of work, where do you think you would benefit from having a structured safety critical communication? Throw your answers in the chat, please. So a major incident is um, absolutely a great example of when we're going to need a safety critical communication. A priority one patient is another good example. What about more in our day-to-day -day life? Um, a high complex attendant. Okay. Uh, what about our day-to-day -day kind of, you know, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis? What's our bread and butter work? What, what parts of that work? would we use structured communication? What, when will we structure our language in a particular way? Uh, resource with a large team. All radio messages. Moving and handling, clinical handover. The one that I was thinking of that happens every single day in the ambulance service is pre-alerts. Pre-alerts are an excellent example of safety critical communications. So what we say is if we if we define uh, when a safety if we define um, a safety critical communication, it is if we're talking about operations and actions that can affect the safety and that of our colleagues, public or our service. So if we're talking about operations and actions that affect our safety and the safety of colleagues, public or our service, then that communication is defined as being safety critical. So every time we hold an operational conversation, we are essentially agreeing a verbal contract. 
So we are agreeing between you know, two or more parties what action each party is going to take based on the information provided in that conversation. And that's a contract. It might be a verbal contract, but it is still contractual that there is still being an agreement made. And it's all about conveying information that is important to the safety of any workers and members of the public. So what safety critical is just basically conveying that information to make sure that everybody understands what's going on. So if we think about our JESSIC principles, this is the shared situational awareness. So we are communicating to make sure that everybody has the same understanding. And it also is the joint understanding of risk. So a lot of safety is to do with managing risk. So we need that joint understanding of risk. And the only way to get that joint understanding is if we communicate effectively so that everybody knows what's going on. Now, it's not good having everybody deciding that they're in charge and trying to make things their way. What we need to do is we need to define a lead person. So one party in the communication will be nominated to take lead responsibility. And this is a concept that comes from other industries such as air traffic control or the Coast Guard. So typically where radios are in use or on events where there is a control room or in ambulance world where we have the emergency operations center, then that lead person is almost universally going to be the controller. Exceptions are obviously the control room manager is going to lead on any conversations with the controller. But generally speaking, where control is an operation, then the controller will be the lead person. But what about all those conversations that are taking place away from the control room or where the control room doesn't need to know straight away? Well, if it's not clear who has lead responsibility or if two people are carrying out the same task in, an, in the same role, or communicating with each other, then the person who starts the conversation must take lead responsibility. So there's no ambiguity there. If you're both doing the same job, if you're both on the same task, you both have the same role, and there's, there's no kind of written down guidelines, then the person who starts the conversation has the lead responsibility. And we need to all be prepared to take the lead in the com communication if the other part he doesn't. So even if it's somebody else's role, if we as professionals um, believe that the other party is not taking lead responsibility, then we need to take that lead responsibility. We need to be proactive. We need to take responsibility. Uh, and we need to say, I believe this is a safety critical communication. I'm going to take the lead. Do you understand why I'm doing this? And we need to expressly state that we have that belief that it's a safety critical communication. And we need to expressly state that we are going to lead from that point onwards. Again, if we are explicit in our language, if we are making those statements in the open, then there is no ambiguity. There can be no misunderstandings because it is, it's spelled out. What people get confused about is being in charge. So being the lead person in a safety critical communication is not about who's in charge. So it's not about who is managing the incident. It's not about who is treating the patient. It's not about who is driving. It is about making sure that at the end of the conversation, there is a clear understanding between every party that was involved in that conversation. The lead person's one and only role is to ensure that every other party in that conversation has a clear understanding about that conversation. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to ensure that difficult situations are dealt with effectively. We need to ma maintain um, good working relationships with our colleagues. We need to reduce the amount of frustration by, that, that's caused by poor communication. And one of the biggest things in all industries is if people aren't communicating effectively, then people are getting frustrated. We need to avoid any misunderstandings because that just causes increased workload for everybody. And we need to reduce the chances where errors can occur. So a couple of other things as well is lead responsibility in a safety critical communication is not about seniority. So I'm the managing director of ProMed. That doesn't mean I'm going to be the lead person in every single communication I have with my colleagues in ProMed. 
I may well sometimes need to be the lead person, but there are other times when I'm not. Now, I can think of, of a really good example in clinical practice where the lead person is, is almost universally not going to be the senior clinician. And that is when we're doing moving and handling and when we're dealing with people who may have spinal injuries. The person at the head will take the lead of that safety critical communication. Quite often, the person at the head is the first responder who's savvy enough, or it's the emergency medical technician. The paramedic or the advanced paramedic or the critical care doctor tend to be a little bit busy doing all of their Gucci things involving veins and scalpels. Um, the person who can't use those is left holding the head, but you tend to pick the savviest one who, who knows what they're doing with this next bit. Because if that person isn't clear in their language, if they don't confirm their understanding with people before the task is carried out, you know, the, 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 the worst example is we'll roll on three. One, two, three, roll. What's just happened? Well, the person holding the head was, was going to roll when they said roll. The person who was holding the shoulders was expecting to go on three. One, two, three, shoulders roll, roll, head then follows. That's completely defied the point of doing a controlled roll because the head and the rest of the body have just became misaligned. Um, well, we all know where that can lead. So what, what, what's often missed is a quick check. Um, also, the, the protocol generally there is just rubbish. Um, you know, the protocol that I always use is ready, brace, roll. So the way I will say it is we will go on roll. I will say ready, brace and roll. We will then all move together on roll. And then I will just pick a random person helping me and I will say, what is the command? Roll. And I'll pick someone else. What's the lead up? Ready, brace. Okay. We all understand what we're doing. Yes. Okay. Ready, brace, roll. Ready, brace, roll. And it is all done in harmony because I took those extra couple of seconds to fully explain how I was going to give my command. And I checked to make sure that at least half of the people involved fully understood the process. I didn't assume that they knew. And I didn't ask, does everybody understand as my first action? Because everyone's just going to nod and agree, even if they don't, because they don't want to be the odd one out. So that's quite often a place where a lead person isn't necessarily the most senior. But there are other examples. I'm sure people can think of some. So what about the other parties? So first of all, we need to identify everybody who needs to be involved. And we need to make sure that they are involved. And we do that at the opening of the conversation. So any critical conversation that we're having, when we're identifying the other parties, we need to include two pieces of information, who they are and where they are. So if you look at it from the point of view of your joining the conversation, you need to say, this is who I am, this is where I am. So you need to state your role. You possibly need to state your name if that's relevant. And that's to ensure that the lead person knows exactly who you are. You then need to say where I am. So this is a very simple description of where you are, but you need to identify your exact location so that it is recognizable to all parties. So for example, hi, I am the medical manager at first aid post three. Fantastic. So that tells me as a controller that this person is the manager and first aid post three, I know where that is on the map. Hi, it's Matt. I'm driving around in my car. Doesn't help. Hi, I'm the emergency medical technician assigned to RRV4. I'm currently approaching purple gate from the direction of blue. So again, that's now confirmed a clinical grade, what resource I'm currently using. And it's confirmed not an exact location, but it's confirmed the rough vicinity and which my direction of travel is. So again, very clear, everybody knows 
who and where. And what we need to do is we need to develop professional working relationships with our fellow industry workers. So quite often in, in the medical world, we work with colleagues in the NHS, we work with colleagues in the private ambulance sector, we work with event medical providers. If we're working on events, then we will be working with the security team, we'll be working with the fire team, we'll be working with the production team. And whoever we are working with, we, we are making operational decisions and our service may impact on them and their service may impact on us. So we need to have that professional working relationship where we are communicating clearly and effectively so that we can kind of have that mutual respect. So if I respect the fact that my colleagues around me, even if I've never met them before, are able to communicate effectively and I demonstrate a willingness to engage in that process, then they will respect me for the fact that I took part in that process. And if I'm leading conversations, then I will have respect for them if they are buying in and using the same language, using the same protocols and the same structure, because we know there's a reason why we're doing it. If we're being respectful, then we can be assertive, we can challenge errors without causing offence, and we can be considerate. And no more important is this when we are doing clinical handovers or when we are working together on a patient. If we're assertive and we're not sure something's correct, then we can challenge that without offending someone. We can be considerate of others. Uh, I've made some pre-alert phone calls. I can remember one where we had a patient who was post-ictal, blah, blah, blah. And we went through the atmist and we went through the OBS and the interventions uh, or, or treatment, sorry. And the doctor on the end of the phone um, said, so you've done this, you've done this. Have you considered um, an MP airway? Uh, oh no, he said, is there an NPA we in? Um, we just said, no, there's not. Have you considered one? Yes, we have. They're maintaining their own airway, blah, blah, blah. Okay, thank you very much. And then that was very professional. It was assertive. It was a challenge on our treatment. Nobody was offended. The doctor was considerate of me. I was considerate of the paramedic I was relaying this to. Uh, and again, the paramedic had respect for the doctor on the end of the phone. And the doctor showed respect for the fact that yes, we had actually considered it and they documented that, you know, this patient will be coming in, but they, and this is their current status. So this is why they've not done that. There was no problem with that. Nobody was offended. It was a very professional, respectful dialogue. And, and that's how safety critical communication should go. So the way I remember this is ABCP. So A is accurate. So we take the time to think about what we're going to say. We're not just going to start blurting out a whole load of things that's a bit superfluous or, well, I don't really know, but I think it's this. Well, I'm going to take the time to find out. I'm going to take the time to make sure that what I'm saying is accurate. I'm only going to say what I know to be true. It's brief. So I stay focused on the facts. I don't introduce information that doesn't need to be introduced. I don't give my opinions. I am brief. So this is 34 year old John. He had a seizure five minutes ago. He's currently on oxygen. He's not needing an airway. His sats are coming back up. I need to get him to the first aid post, please. That's it. I've not discussed the fact that I don't know whether he's epileptic. I've not discussed the fact that I've not got around to doing a PM yet. I've not discussed the fact that, you know, his wife is running around crying. I've not added any detail that didn't need to be added. I've just said, this is what happened to my patient. This is the current situation and why I need them moving. And that's it. End of story. Key facts. By the time the crew arrived to hand over, I might have more facts. I'm still going to be brief with it. I might just have more facts. So again, I'm going to be accurate. I'm not going to say, well, oh, I think you might be because, well, I've tried this and it's not that. So I'm, I'm left with this. I'm not wasting my time. I am focusing on the facts that are relevant and I'm focused on sticking to what we know. And that's going to be clear. So I'm speaking slowly and clearly to give more thinking time. And quite often when, when situations happen, people start to rush. Actually, what, what people need to be doing is taking a really big deep breath here. And that's giving us thinking time as the speaker. But by speaking slowly and clearly, we're giving the recipient of the message a bit more thinking time. There is no good trying to overload somebody, just trying to get all that information out 
and overloading somebody else because all that's going to happen is you're going to need to ask to repeat that information so if we speak slowly we speak clearly some people find it helps to write down that information before they, they give it um i'm currently working on a fire policy rewrite for somebody and one of the things that i've asked to be introduced is cue cards laminated cue cards and on the back of certain key roles who may end up with a responsibility to place the 999 call i've asked for methane as lines so i want a little laminated card m e t h a n e with lines across it and i want that because then if they do have to make that 999 call for a fire it just give them that little moment with a whiteboard marker uh, this this place happens to be full of teachers and it's going to remain anonymous but you know most teachers have whiteboard markers or sharpies or something to write on a laminated surface so they can write down right exact location well that's actually going to be pre-filled because the building's not going to move type of incident fire but there's going to be more space to enter any additional information hazards well that's going to be left blank so they can scribble access that's going to be pre-filled number of casualties that's going to be blank but there's going to be prompts and emergency services required fire is going to be ticked and then there's going to be police ambulance and so on with tick boxes so it just gives them that oh my god oh my god oh my god there's a fire oh my god oh my god oh hang on cue card right okay right i know where i am i know it's a fire oh oh it's this as well i can tick that all right we know where the access is oh hazards oh uh right we've got this we've got that and then by the time they then down 999 it'll say at the bottom now down 999 they've had that opportunity to compose themselves so that when they're on the phone they're speaking slowly and clearly and giving that call handler enough time to type in everything step by step without missing any important details and the p is professional so it is showing that respect that we've just talked about it is making sure that our language isn't colloquial it's making sure that we're not introducing any unnecessary jargon we are being professional we are being respectful we are using appropriate terminology um we're not going oi jimmy you seen that half dead one on the floor over there should go and get them no it is first responder from first responder to i believe i can see a possibly unconscious patient please could you assist me you know having that professional dialogue if anybody overheard this conversation would they understand that this was a, a critical communication between colleagues or would they think we were having a bit of banter you know make make that distinction make it very very clear and we need to get this into our day-to-day -day operational conversations so any operational conversation we're having we need the abcp we need to be accurate brief clear and professional because if we can get into those habits if we can think through what we're saying before we're saying it if we can make sure that we keep it to the facts if we can take our time when we're relaying that information and we practice doing that in every operational conversation then when it comes to needing to be safety critical it's not going to be like we're speaking a foreign language it's not going to be that we're sticking on oh hang on what do we need to do here because it is a practiced and rehearsed method in the order we do it we need to make sure that we give the information first before actions so if you think about at mist you know it's age time injuries mechanism it uh, sorry mechanism injuries uh signs and symptoms treatment provided and then we have the er which is estimated time of request of arrival and requests so we give the at mist which is the information then we do the er which is the actions that are then going to be required and if you look at methane so we declare the major incident we give the location the type the hazards the access the number of casualties and then finally we request emergency services so we give the information first and then we move on to the actions we need to use the phonetic alphabet and we need to use standard words and phrases 
So when we're using the phonetic alphabet, that is the NATO phonetic alphabet, alpha, bravo, charlie, delta, echo, foxtrot, golf, hotel, india, juliet, kilo, lima, mike, november, oscar, whiskey, uh, mike, november, oscar, papa, sierra, tango, uniform, victor, whiskey, x-ray, yankee, and zulu. I'll do the 26, that, that's not my abbreviated form. We don't use our own words. We don't go J for jam. We don't go S for sugar. It is the NATO phonetic alphabet because by using the NATO phonetic alphabet, it is known worldwide. Absolutely, key stage one. It's amazing how many times you listen to a radio and you hear people give, give some information and you hear S for sugar all the time. Uh, it's like, when did you learn the phonetic alphabet? Sierra is the word we would use for S. So if you don't know the phonetic alphabet, and there are a million and one resources on Google, please go and look it up. Print one off, laminate one, attach it with an elastic band to your radio, stick it to the front of your helmet, whatever you need to do, learn that phonetic alphabet. And same with the standards, words and phrases. They are standard words and phrases, usually organization-wide or perhaps event-wide, but we use the standard words and phrases. We don't invent our own between the group of two or three people. We use the standard words and phrases because otherwise they're not standard words and phrases. If we're giving long messages, so just going back to that point on brief, if we're giving long messages, it needs to be broken down into manageable chunks. So go back to the radio communications webinar, look at how we gave those longer messages. So then we need to check for our understanding. Now, when we're on the receiving end, our responsibility is to repeat back what we've heard, outline our understanding of any actions that are required and clarify anything that we're unsure of. We are not parrots. So we do not say word for word verbatim what was said to us. We're not an MP3 recorder, okay? We're not a playback service. We're not saying what was said. What we're doing is summarizing that information and saying what we understand our actions to be. Because this is where the errors occur. Errors tend not to occur in the literal hearing or understanding of the words. Errors then occur in that translation between what we heard and what we think we need to do. Now, our, our, our brain's a little bit strange there, and it just kind of, we have our own preconceived ideas. We combine our preconceived ideas with what information we are being presented with and we in our mind come up with some kind of middle ground but actually that that wasn't what we were asked to do so we need to make sure that what we are repeating back is our understanding of it and not just verbatim words so stress causes mistakes in ourselves and others so usually when we're giving safety critical communications there's a bit of stress you know we've got a patient who needs urgent treatment we've just came across a road traffic collision there's a fire so it's fair to say there's, there's a little bit of adrenaline pumping. There's a little bit of stress. There's something in the back of our mind going, oh, right, yeah, need to get us done. Right, you know, we're on here. Get on with it. So stress, we know, leads to mistakes. So by repeating things back and clarifying the actions, we're aiding our decision making and we're helping to remember what it is that we need to do. So we're mitigating against the risk that stress is causing. So stress is creating a risk that we're going to have make a mistake, but by repeating back, we're controlling that risk because we are helping ourselves to remember what we need to do. So we can repeat back at any stage of a conversation. So if we're breaking the conversation up into chunks, we can repeat back or we can give one action and repeat it back and then a second action, repeat it back and so on. However, we must, must, must at the end of a safety critical communication, do a repeat back and check for understanding. Um, if the repeat back is wrong and that happens, then the person who is lead responsibility needs to restate the actions and ask for another repeat back. And you keep cycling that process until the repeat back is correct. When we aren't doing those corrections, then we need to say the word correction and we need to give the full message again. So we don't just say correction, I meant to say this. You know, we don't just say correction in one or two words. We say correction, 
and go back to the beginning of the sentence or go back to the beginning of the action and restate the full thing because that way there's no cognitive load because what happens is if we say part of it then there's a bit of cognitive load then there's a bit of hang on he said this he's cancelled that he said this let's put them together and one add one tends to make three when, when we let our mind do the work so when we say correction then our brain can erase that previous message in full and then we just start writing our new message in our brain so because we just erased that full message we're not trying to merge them together then there can't be that that kind of thinking process getting things wrong if we're the person with lead responsibility and we've not had the other party repeat their understanding of the message then it is our responsibility to ask for that so if we're leading that conversation and you know we've said okay so i want you to do this i want you to do that i want you to do this whatever and the other person just goes right okay thanks very much they've not repeated that back we don't know for definite that their understanding of what we've asked is the same as our understanding of what we've asked so as the lead person at this point i'm going to go just before you go can you just confirm back to me what you're now going to do please no right okay this conversation hasn't ended until you have repeated back what it is i would like you to do and we need to make sure that is repeated and we need to make sure that that understanding is the same as our understanding because if it's not then there's a misunderstanding and that'll lead to mistakes and if mistakes happen well then we're back to the point of getting frustrated and if we're frustrated then we're stressed and if we're stressed then we're going to cause more mistakes and you can see very quickly how this can descend into a bit of a problem so confirmation of actions so actions can be passed in both directions so it's not just the lead person who can give some actions it may also be any other party who could need an action of another so we need to use definitive language we need to make sure it's unambiguous and that's going to help prevent any misunderstandings so when i'm saying definitive language what i mean is we are saying you must I'm not saying I'd like you to. I'm not saying can you. I'm not saying please will you. I am saying you must. I might well say you must go to the first aid post and bring me the defib back to this patient, please. It's fine to be polite and it's encouraged that we're polite, but then there has to be that must statement. We can't just dilly dally, you know, could you go and get that, please? No you must get that defib you must bring it to me as soon as possible please there has to be that must because otherwise people don't necessarily have that imperativeness do nothing until is a perfectly valid action that i want somebody to take do nothing until i give you my next command do nothing until the safety officer tells you that it is safe to enter that premises do nothing until you call me back and tell me you have arrived at the rvp whatever that is do nothing until is an instruction it, it prevents people jumping in before it's safe to do so and it makes it absolutely clear that those further actions do not take place until that condition is met and I usually make sure that do nothing until requires further communication. Do nothing until you arrive at gate one and call me to confirm where you are. That way I know positively that the next action will then be carried out. And yeah, it is really, really key and really, really critical that we make explicit any conditions so um you know covid ambulance unloading if you've worked in the ambulance service through covid and when hospitals had the red zone the amazon the green zone the favorite one was when the halos would decide that we're reverting back to keeping the patients on board the trucks but then didn't really tell anybody and you'd walk off with your patient right okay take your patient back to your truck um and, and uh, when, when the corridor is clear, we'll, we'll get triage underway. 
So then all of a sudden, three more people, when they see the corridor is clear, will bring their patient up the corridor. And the halo would look frustrated because there's still three patients on the corridor. The halo believed that he had told everybody to wait on their ambulance until he had came out and invited them in. Every crew had believed that they'd been asked to wait until the queue had died down and the corridor was clear so there was more space for them to then be on the corridor. Really simple misunderstanding. But all that halo needed to do was go, do nothing until I come to the ambulance and tell you to bring your patient in. That one little phrase there, do nothing until, would have prevented all of that because you've been told your action is to do nothing. So don't be afraid to tell somebody to do nothing. That is a perfectly valid action. So priority communications. This is an emergency call. So on a radio, we might have priority. priority. We, we may have other kind of language that we use on a radio. We might be pressing a particular button. But actually, once we press that button, if there's no priority protocol in place, then I always say, this is an emergency call. I've even used it when I placed the 999 call for the simple reason that it is getting across that A, I know what I'm talking about, and B, prick your ears up. You might be going off script a little bit, but prick your ears up because I'm going to give you some information that's damn important. Um, you know, if I'm making a telephone call to a control room and it's serious, I will say this is an emergency call. When I'm briefing staff and I'm giving them the control room phone number and I'm giving them the alternative priority control room phone number as well, I will always say, if you ring this number, start with, this is an emergency call. If you can't remember which number to ring, ring any number that will get you to the control room and just say, this is an emergency call. Because by saying that, the controller's ears are gonna prick up and go, oh, emergency, right, need to do something. And it just, you know, if you're in a busy control room, lots of phones going off and somebody says that, and quite often I'll just put my hand in and go, and that will be enough for everybody else in the room just to lower their voices. If they're not already engaged on something, they'll turn and they'll track me because I might have something going off. So somebody said to me, this is an emergency call. And I've just gone, and everyone's now tracking me because somebody on the end of the phone wants something. I don't know what the situation is yet, but then they're listening. So when I'm then repeating back what I'm being told, those who've had the opportunity to listen to me can then start on their standing orders. They can start on their usual protocols. So if this is an emergency call, it's because there's a fight and I go, okay, you confirm you've got a fight with persons injured. It is in the vicinity of Arena Gate 4. Okay, can you tell me about the casualties, please? Because I've repeated back that information, the security controller has dispatched their team. My colleague next to me has realized that we're probably going to need a few more first aid resources, so they've started to look for who's available. They're waiting for me to give some casualty information, but at least security on their way. CCTV have spun round and, and heard me say Arena Gate 4. They're looking for Arena Gate 4 on the monitors. They're going to put it up on the big monitor. So by, by outlining at the beginning, this is an emergency call, you're not just getting your controller switched on, but that controller is then able to take those immediate steps so that when they come to their repeat back, everybody's ready for that information and they can start taking their actions without necessarily needing to be told what to do. Take a deep breath and plan what you're going to say in advance. So don't panic. Take a deep breath and just plan what you're going to say. Even use that time when you're saying this is an emergency call just to get a couple of more things straight in your head before you blurt them out. Know where you are. There, there is nothing worse than I'd love, you know, I, I've had this too many times in security control. I need a medic. I need a medic. There's someone unconscious. There's someone fitting. Someone's got a head injury. Great. I need a medic now. Uh-huh. Get me a medic. Uh-huh. Do you want to tell me where you are? I'm in the middle of the field. Yep. Give me a location. By the tents. 
still need an exact location. Near the big fire tower. There's six of those. The one with the tents. Still six. Um, there's a green tent. Half the field. It, it, it's so difficult in control knowing that somebody has a genuine emergency and needs assistance and and you you literally cannot even make the next call to dispatch anybody because you've identified four five six seven resources that are appropriate to dispatch to that task but you don't know which ones to dispatch because you don't know which is the nearest so it's not even like you can raid your one of them and place them on standby while you're waiting further because you don't know which one needs to go so you're absolutely stuck at that point until you can get that location so know where you are i wouldn't even place the emergency call until you know where you are because if you've got what three words on your phone use what three words then place your emergency call because at least that way you know where you are think about what might be required so if you know you've got an emergency think about what you're going to need because actually an emergency if you can just relay i'm here i need this right actions you are there i'm going to send you that bang 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 that's done next okay tell me what's going on because at least that point we're starting to contain the situation at least that way the, the important thing is things are on their way to help you and they're going to where you are that's it even if you then collapse if you fall to pieces and, and start crying it doesn't actually matter at that point there are people on their way to help if we've got that out of the way those people who arrive can then take over that communication if needs be they are just the two vital things i need as a controller if i can get those two things in i can act on it without those two things i'm going to struggle just get me those two and i will then work the miracles that i need to work even if that means I've literally just got you speechless and crying or on the floor or whatever on the end of my phone, I'm not bothered. I've got help coming to you. They'll take over that communication. Get that right. Um, any other notes I put on here? Remember, again, it's safe to critical communication, basically. So once you've said this is an emergency call, your ABCP still runs through this. So you're still going to be accurate. You're still going to be brief. You're still going to be clear still going to speak slowly still going to be professional so i set critical communication protocols we've looked at when they're going to be needed and, and what they are we've defined the role of a lead person what their responsibilities are we've also been quite clear on what the lead person isn't we've discussed how the other parties get involved in the call how they introduce themselves and we've discussed the idea of verbal contracts we've gone through the general points so the abcp the phonetic alphabet We've gone through checking for understanding and repeat backs. We've looked at the confirmation of actions, including doing nothing. And we've gone through how to start a priority communication and the absolute vital key things that need to be in one. So thank you very much to the, let's have a look, 15 people who have stayed the course of this webinar. If you would like your CPD certificate for attending tonight, please email webinars at promed999.co.uk with your full name. We are going to check the register in Zoom to verify that you've been here. So if you use a different email address when you email us, please tell us the email address that you've used tonight in Zoom. If you have a different name on Zoom to what you want on the certificate, please make sure you give us both names. And we are going to verify that you've left us a review on one of the many review sites that we're about to tell you about. And we'll get your digital certificates across to you within three business days. So please do leave us at least one review. So tonight's webinar has been free of charge. So all we ask is for a little bit of feedback. That can be good feedback. That can be bad feedback. If it's bad feedback, please just let us know how we can improve because we are constantly evolving and improving. And if we know what would help you learn, if we know what subject areas will be of interest to you, then we can provide that. Uh, we are on Trustpilot. We are on Yell. Google and on Facebook and ProMed admin team will be making those magically appear in the chat so you can click on them and that just throws it over to you. So does anybody have any questions about safety critical communications? You can type it into the chat box or you can press the button to raise your hand and we'll invite you to unmute yourself 
and then we can have a two-way conversation which is much more interactive so please type in the chat or raise your hand and discuss verbally So the only questions that have been asked so far is what is next week's topic? So next week's topic, we're going to be looking at the time phases of major incidents. So from the when it happens right the way through to, I may as well tell you, to the restoration of normality. So what's involved in each of those phases? What services we'd expect to see? What activities are going to be carried out? Um, how much interest we get from the public in each of those phases? Um, so the time phase of major incident um the following week the 26th november we're going to be doing the rescheduled webinar from last week which is the safety considerations for medical providers at events and incidents the 3rd of december i'm looking at one of my admin team who did give me a topic that we were going to do when i was having a conversation with them last night and I'm really hoping they're going to throw that topic in the chat for me because they've not um, popped it on the list that I'm looking at. But we do have one planned for the 12th, for the 3rd of December. And, and I'm just waiting on admin team to tell me what that topic is because um, we had a little chat about it last night. And it's completely slipped my mind. Then I did ask them to write it down for me. So I'm just really embarrassed that I can't remember this. But anyway, we do have a few plans. Uh, we, we do have them planned. Um, we're going to run them on the 3rd, 10th and 17th of December. And then we're going to have a two week break for Christmas and New Year. And then we'll be back in webinar mode from Thursday, the 7th of January is when we're going to be back after that. So you can start putting that in your diary. Anybody have any more questions about safety critical communications, please ask. Raise your hand and let's have a chat. Okay, we're not seeing any more questions come through. So just a reminder about your CPD certificates, uh, just follow the instructions on the chat there. Drops an email, webinars at promet999.co.uk with a full name for your certificate. And if your full name and your email address are different to Zoom, please tell us what they are so we can verify that on Zoom's register. We'll verify that there's been a review left on one of the platforms and we'll get you your certificate in three business days. If you have missed the webinar watched on YouTube, all you need to do is email webinars at promed999.co.uk with a one paragraph summary, so three or four sentences summarizing your learning from that webinar so we can believe that you genuinely have watched it. And then we will very happily issue you a certificate for that webinar as well. So our sites for reviews, please use Trustpilot, Yale, Google or Facebook. That will um, make us very happy. It, it's great to receive feedback. Uh, what we especially like is when people give us the four stars and then tell us what we need to do in order to get that fifth star, because then we know that we're improving and delivering a better quality of service next time around. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll leave the chat and the webinar open until 8 p.m., give you a chance to click on any links that you need to click on or network, and then we will shut this down. And we will see you all next week on Thursday, the 19th of November, 2020, for time phases of major incidents. And that'll be at seven o'clock on Zoom. Thank you very much.